One of the most extraordinary findings from our researches for these programs is that the so-called paranormal is far more normal than is commonly believed. Go to any town or village, almost walk down any street, and you will come across stories of extraordinary events that are difficult to explain away on any rational or scientific basis. In this programme, we tell two strange stories that come from Devon, from villages on the southern edge of Dartmoor. The Allen family live in the village of Heathfield Down. They're just about as typical a family as you are likely to meet anywhere in England. Ricky, the father, is in his early 50s. He served in the armed forces. His business ran into trouble during the recession, and he now runs a minicab service. Jackie, his wife, is a highly qualified surgical nurse. She spends her days in the operating theater at the local hospital. Suzanne, the daughter, is 21 years old, and Richard, the son, is 20. The first indication that things were not quite right was a strange sense of dread and foreboding in Richard's bedroom. It was very strange feelings I had inside myself. It, it, the, the ghost actually felt like it was, I don't know, telling me to do things or trying to, but it was all very confusing, really. There was um, not arguments, but it was fraught. Um, Richard especially was always in strange moods. Um, he would get in really bad moods for no reason and things like that. And you didn't feel happy wondering about the house, or I didn't feel happy wondering about the house at night. At first, the family was scarcely able to admit to themselves that anything was radically wrong. But the strange events and disturbing feelings continued unabated, growing more unnerving all the time. And then there used to be this smell of... It's like you have a candle, you blow it out, and it's that instant smell afterwards that you get. And it used to be up the top of the stairs, on the stairs, in this room. Not all the time, but when it come, it was strong. My TV used to turn on and off and over channels quite a lot. It used to just... I mean, the remote control used to be on the floor... There was no reason nobody was using the telly downstairs. We tried the remotes in the other rooms to see if it would switch channels in other rooms, but it didn't. Um, so that was another thing. Also, when we first moved in, the toilet chain used to flash for no reason. Um, we actually had all the bathroom taken out and put back in when it was refurbished, and obviously everything was new. It used to be an old chain flash that you pulled down. It's all new, but it still used to happen. The chain would still go, especially at night when you were settled down to sleep. So desperate did the situation become that Brenda, a neighbour interested in spiritual affairs, was asked if she could perceive anything wrong in the house. Um, there was something definitely wrong in this room. In fact, it was such a, a powerful thing that I could hardly stand up. Um, I tried backing out of the room, which was very difficult, to get down the stairs. So I had to sit on the stairs because the power was uh, too much for me. I heard a phone call from Brenda to say that there was, this house was very, very cold and there was a lot of bad vibration. The family itself, the atmosphere amongst the family had changed. I rang Helen, who was my friend, who we worked together, and arranged to come out. John Parker's day job is bricklaying. In the evenings and at night, he operates a psychic rescue service for people in distress. He claims that his caseload runs into the thousands. Helen is described as a trans medium. As John explains it, entities or spirits they encounter would enter Helen's body so that John can talk to them and try to convince them to move on to the next world. Helen, however, didn't want to be filmed. As they walked into the door, Helen walked straight upstairs where she felt she ought to go, and John came into the living room here. And Helen came down a few minutes later and she said, yes, there's definitely an entity up there that shouldn't be there. And she said, basically, John, we've got to do this tonight and now. 
We were all sitting round with our arms folded across our solar plexus. This was so that the entity didn't jump in to anybody else. Uh, we also were not supposed to speak for the same reason. Um, Helen sat down and went into a trance and she just breathed very deeply. John then started to talk after a while to Helen. The voice come through, first of all, it was another lady who puts the spirit into Helen's body and she said she was ready to begin. And it didn't actually like strike me it was actually real until the lady uh, the lady's voice like totally changed and it was like a really deep sort of masculine voice coming out of this lady and the ghost was speaking through this lady saying like oh I, I wanted to kill him and things and that like freaked me out a bit according to John Parker's explanation afterwards the spirit was a long dead person called Philip he lived on the land where the house now stands and he was a practitioner of black magic as part of one of his rituals, he had murdered his best friend and now seemed unable to escape from the location. And Philip come in. He was really angry at first. He started swearing at us and all sorts of things. It was as if he could use modern day language, but he couldn't understand it. Um, John called him babe a couple of times and he kept saying, I don't understand babe, I don't understand babe. Yet he could swear at us in modern day language. The conversation between John and the entity, uh, as I said, was aggressive, and it, the point of that was that the entity didn't want to leave. He was enjoying himself, he was getting up to mischief and generally creating uh, havoc. And John's point to him was that he ought to go because of the havoc he's causing and that he cannot advance himself or grow unless he actually moves on. It was, it was his time to go. He shouldn't be here. It wasn't his place. Um, he tried to get up, or tried to get Helen to get up at the chair several times. John kept telling him to sit down again. But um, he said that John said that he couldn't actually get out of the chair, but he was trying because he, he was just trying to escape. There was one time when I, I felt quite uh, afraid, and that was when the entity jumped out of the body of Helen, the medium, uh, because nobody knew where the entity was actually headed for. So I think at that point everybody felt a bit scared. Um, John said, you've been taunting Richard, you've been doing wicked things, and he said yes. And he said why, and it was all for power and control, and he wanted to kill people still, even though he was dead. Um, and there was a lot of to in and fro in, and John got a bit angry at times because of the swearing that the entity was doing. And basically it come down to it that it was actually a friend of his that you could actually see in the light that actually talked the entity into going with him from the light, plus his mum was there as well for him to go to. We all sat there very quietly for a while and sort of just sat in shock, I think. It was, although things had happened before, it was a great shock to hear it and see it in front of your eyes. It's not the sort of thing that you believe until you see. Um, we sat there for a long, long time, all of us, and sort of slowly, gradually, like you come round from a sleep, we began to talk. I actually, in, in terms of speaking about it, I broke him and broke the mind so that he would accept that what he'd done, he'd done. The minute you got to that stage, the attitude, a mental attitude of the spirit completely changed and he became like an ordinary human being. All you have to do is to convince the person, the entity itself, that it is not of this world. Once you can do that, it's, it's a simple matter then of bringing someone in and both of them going together. And it's as simple as that. In John's explanation, the murdered friend returned and there was a reconciliation. And together, 
they moved off into the light. That is always the phrase that is used. The point is that whether or not you choose to accept John's explanation, it is undeniable that something happened in the house that evening that transformed the atmosphere there. Since it's all happened and uh, John and the lady Helen has gone and the, the ghost has been sent forward and what have you, I haven't actually sensed any weird or different smells or any strange happenings. I've been a lot, lot happier in myself and my whole attitude's changed a lot, really. And there's no, there's no more flushing of the loo in the middle of the night or anything like that, really. We don't get smells anymore. Um, Richard's moods are better <laughs> and things are a lot happier. I can walk about the house at night and up and down the stairs without worrying at all. It's, I wouldn't worry as much as I do, that's for sure. After John and Helen went, there was never, ever any more smells of candles burning, no more problems at all. I went up into the bedroom uh, where he was and there was a very, very strong smell of sweetness up there, like very, very strong flowers, a, a smell that couldn't have been put there. Uh, it was very, very strong and very, very fragrant, beautiful. A few miles to the west of Heathfield Down, where the Allens live, right up on the edge of the moor, under the looming rocks of Hounds Tor, there is a lonely crossroads. This is the site of a single isolated grave, known to everybody locally as Jay's grave. Jay was, it seems, a young woman, Kitty Jay, and her grave is associated with a long-standing mystery. It always has a fresh spray of flowers on it. No one admits to putting them there. No one has ever seen anyone putting them there. But nevertheless, they are always there, day after day after day. Kirsty Peak has lived nearby for many years. I ride past here every day. I come up here with the horse to go and meet friends to go off riding. And when I come past, I always notice that there's flowers on the grave. Um, and even when it's really bad weather, there's always flowers on the grave or greenery or something local. Um, I don't, and I speak to people and they're not putting the flowers on. During the summer, I come here very, very often and there's always fresh flowers here. Gina Williams is a local historian who has looked into the background of many of the stories of Dartmoor, including the story of Kitty Jay. She was an orphan girl that took work at a nearby farm called Canna. And she became pregnant and hung herself because there was so much um, stigma attached to it. And she was buried at this crossways because they believed then the devil couldn't get at her soul. Well, James Bryant, who had the land round here in the 1850s, 60s, he in fact opened, had, or had the grave opened to check and did in fact find the bones of a young woman. And it's he who had the grave uh, made as it is now, putting headstones and footstones. Um, and since then, the, um, the, the flowers have appeared, always. Over the years, the mystery of the flowers has inspired many people to spend a vigil at the grave to see where the flowers come from, but with no very conclusive result. Um, some time ago, some scouts uh, camped here and um, they watched all night, or so they said. Uh, they never saw anybody or heard anything. And when they got up in the morning, there were fresh flowers on the grave. We asked John Parker to visit Jay's grave to see if he could shed any light on the mystery, both of her death and the perennial flowers. To pick up a vibration, what is here? and what can be seen. Here lies a young lady between 16 and 22 years old as I look at her. And she is laid out in this direction, pointing due east. From, from this, a 
or pick up a vibration of very, very sad. But there's not one human remains here, but two. One of a baby, very, very, very small. That, of course, doesn't really get us any further forward. We already knew that a young girl was involved, and the legend has it that she was pregnant. And that, of course, is the problem with mediums. It is extremely difficult to verify either the information they come up with or the contacts they claim to make. However, there is no doubt they do very often help to clarify or resolve difficult psychic situations. When a psychic medium is perceiving something that has happened, the question is, what is occurring? There are two sets of explanations. The first one is that these are particularly sensitive people, sensitive to nonverbal cues. So they're picking up uh, atmosphere from everything which is around. There's nothing paranormal about it. That's the first explanation. The second one is that we do not yet understand fully the nature of time. You see, as far as the brain is concerned, time can alter enormously. For example, the whole of creation I can see in one split moment of time in certain mental states. So time is an artifact of the way the brain is constructed. Nowadays, many people believe that, oh, isn't mediumship just a bit of a charlatan's paradise and uh, frauds and so on? And no doubt there is a percentage of mediums who are fake, but the fact that there are counterfeit coins in the circulation doesn't mean that all coins are counterfeit. Counterfeit coin or real? we decided to set up a rather more difficult test. And so, without warning, we asked John Parker if he would visit the cottage nearest to Jay's grave to see if we could establish any verifiable connections with her story. The house is now owned by a retired couple. Uh, we've lived here for about 10 years, having retired from the Royal Air Force, and we're well aware of the story of Jay's grave, and as you're aware, we're about the nearest really old house. John spent some time walking around the house, absorbing the atmosphere. Meanwhile, we had arranged for a psychic artist, Mary Searle, to come to the house and sit in one of the rooms, set quite apart from John, to see if she could draw any of her own perceptions. I, I couldn't find anything incorporating Jay's grave, but I have seen two people who have returned on a nostalgic visit. Um, one, a lady, early 50s maybe, um, five foot four, five foot five. I also saw a man in the main bedroom, 40 to 50 years old, quite longish hair, um, with something around his neck, with sort of two tassels, who I have the impression is like a clergyman. Other than that, there's nothing else, just that. But I think these two are here because when they were on the earth, they had some sort of association with the actual building itself. John felt he'd made contact with two psychic personas. One of them he described as a clergyman, either the 18th century or possibly early 19th. Meanwhile, Mary, completely isolated, had drawn a clergyman's portrait. It was, by any standards, an extraordinary meeting of minds. The vibration that I get off him um, is he's friendly, he's come for yes. a visit. Yeah. Um, as though he used to live here. Can you understand what you mean? He used to live here, yes, yes but he wasn't, he, he wasn't like an owner of the place. He, I felt he lodged here, John. I don't know. Well, I just, I just, I all I can put is that he's actually stayed in this house. Yes, and oh that's, yes. That's, that's what I was picking up. Mm -hmm. 
I just think it's uncanny that uh, that both uh, John and Mary can come up with the same um, thought in one hand and portrait in another of, of, of the same person, being the Reverend in this particular case. Uh, I don't know whether he's put a name to it. Has he put a name to this? Or just says parson or clerical? Um, and that also uh, Stephen Nosworthy is mentioned in our deeds. A Reverend uh, Nosworthy, Stephen Nosworthy, is mentioned in these abstracts of title. And although I feel that he didn't actually own the house, his family, the Nosworthy, owned it, and there's no doubt that as a vicar in the local parish, he no doubt either passed this way or may well have visited uh, a house owned by his family during the early 1800s. Well, I was, I was impressed by the uh, similarity in what uh, the two people had to say, um, because although I'm not specifically a sceptic, I would say I'm a bit of a realist. I would like things presented to me in hard fact. Um, but I did find that it uh, gave me a rather a start when the parson or vicar type element was introduced into the conversation. But John had mentioned a second person, a woman this time. Remarkably, Mary had also produced a second drawing of a woman with the name Eliza attached to it. Uh, uh, as far as Eliza goes, uh, in the deeds there is an Elizabeth Nodsworthy who, uh, in fact, was um, uh, going to marry Robert Nodsworthy. And um, looking at her face, I would think that, although there have been Elizabeths later on, uh, in 1910, uh, this woman is obviously too, too old looking, I think, to have been a 19... She's got to be um, one of the, the older characters and is possibly Elizabeth Nosworthy, who would look very weather-beaten even at the age of 50 because up here would have been a very hard life. Not, I mean, it's, it's bad enough at times now, but uh, then it would have been very bad indeed. Just who it is who puts the flowers on Kitty Jay's grave we may never know, but we do know that one Reverend John Nosworthy, and later on a woman called Elizabeth, must have passed these very crossroads on many occasions. And who knows, they may still do so. Certainly it would seem some element of their presence remains detectable in the house beneath Hounds Tor. <laughs> 